Hey there, once again, guys. My name is Ben Ferriolo. First off, if this video is extremely long and it pretty much is going to be, please skip to a part that interests you by utilizing the parts section shown in the description box directly below. Now, the parts section lists the volcanoes and the aspects that I talk about for that section, allowing you to skip to a volcano that you want to hear about. I typically spend no more than five minutes on each volcano. However, I spend much more time on Yellowstone and Long Valley supervolcanoes. Please like, share, and subscribe if you like my work. Also, please visit my website. It contains a great deal of information. It can show you how to find seismic data, how to find even GPS data, how to analyze it, and with what programs to analyze it with, and much more. It even shows you earthquake examples and hundreds upon hundreds of seismic plots pertaining to many different earthquake swarms and events. There's also a link in the description box below right under my email address. This is the monthly volcano report for April 2019. The reported earthquake counts that I state are taken directly from the United States Geological Survey and their partners and are only earthquakes reported, not earthquakes recorded. In regards to earthquake counts, it is likely a lot of the time that the reported earthquake total for a given location and time period, mostly during earthquake swarms, is lower than the actual count of earthquakes, in some cases sometimes drastically lower. This has to do with a multitude of factors, including inability to locate and lack of instruments and other reasons. Sometimes it makes sense and sometimes it doesn't. It is my goal somewhere down the line to major in seismology and also study volcanology, but I do believe I am properly equipped to give you guys a heads up if anything concerning may occur at volcanoes throughout the United States. Remember, most earthquake swarms of volcanoes do not lead to eruptions, but almost every eruption is preceded by some type of earthquake swarm. Therefore, swarms should always be monitored closely, especially the ones that are underreported, but clearly show hundreds of events. The volcanoes I'll be doing monthly and yearly updates on will be Yellowstone Supervolcano in Wyoming, Long Valley Supervolcano in California, Newberry Caldera in Mount Hood in Oregon, Mount Rainier and Mount St. Helens in Washington State, and Mount Shasta in Lassen Peak in California. Glacier Peak, a volcano that is about 50 miles or so east of me, has no monitoring instruments except for one mediocre seismograph. The Pacific Northwest Seismic Network is putting new instruments there soon, hopefully, and Glacier Peak will be added to the updates once monitor installation has been completed. In this video and other updates, we will look at earthquake and deformation counts. The time period of the reported earthquake counts for this video, derived from the USGS Earthquake Catalog, is from 0 UTC, April 1st, 2019, through 2359 UTC, April 30th, 2019, and magnitudes are always going to be negative 0.5 and above, so you will always see every single earthquake that was reported for this time period. Yes, earthquakes can occur at negative magnitudes, but require sensitive seismographs to locate. Thank God a lot of the seismic instruments being activated these days are sensitive enough for such recordings. I like to call these negative earthquakes micro-minis. Also, the coordinate box that I use for each volcano is exactly the same every month, so you will always see the activity that occurred in the same area for each month. Every month's update will be uploaded about five days or so after the month in question has ended. Also, in regards to the three plot seismic images I generate for the largest events, I will always try my best to use the closest seismic station to any given event. As always, let's start with Yali. And here we are at Yellowstone Caldera, Hebgen Lake, Earthquake Lake, West Thumb Lake, Shoshone Lake, Lewis Lake, Yellowstone Lake, and the Promontory. So those are the areas. Norris is right about here. Mary Lake is right about here. There were only 58 earthquake events reported for the Yellowstone area for the month of April 2019. That is far lower than the total of about 130 earthquakes last month. Yellowstone is an area that I monitor the most out of all the volcanoes that I keep an eye on. And, except for the past week or less, seismic activity at Yellowstone has been extremely low during the month of April 2019. Here's the Yellowstone Volcano page on volcanos.usgs.gov. I believe they have moved some of their things on their website. So when you go to the Yellowstone Volcano, simply click Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. And that'll bring you to the page where, the, you know, they have the Yellowstone Monthly Update. And they actually have a video update, the second video monthly update. They're still not reporting the most recent Steamboat Geyser eruption, but they probably will very, very, very soon. And Yellowstone Monthly Update. Let's click here just to see what they have to say real fast. There were two water eruptions of Steamboat Geyser in April 2019, on April 8th and April 25th. The latter is just in time for the opening of the region to visitors. Speaking of visitors, if you will be in the Yellowstone area in May, we invite you to join us for a pair of public lectures. They're going to have some lectures in West Yellowstone. 
Uh, let's see. The month of May also marks the start of field season. Woohoo! So keep your eyes open for Yellowstone Volcano Observatory scientists in the Yellowstone Park this month. They will be conducting maintenance on monitoring stations. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Woohoo! We are getting maintenance on some of those seismic and GPS stations, guys. So hopefully soon we'll be seeing LKWY come back online. Uh, let's see. YMP? No, no, not YMP. YMS from Mount Sheridan. That needs a big overhaul. Same with YPP. I think that's a station also that needs a big, big overhaul. Especially since a lot of the swarms near Shoshone and Lewis Lake seem to be closest to YPP. But since YPP doesn't record anything at all, I mean, it's, it's faulty, that's for sure. It, they can't use it. Nobody can use it for analysis. So for the recent swarms there, I would have loved to have YPP. Hopefully they get that station fixed. YVO, if you're listening to this, please fix YPP first and then move on to the other stations. That would be great. Deploying new equipment. Oh, maybe we'll get a few new seismic and GPS stations. I'm hoping. And conducting geological map and water studies. During April 2019, they located 57 earthquakes. Largest being a 2.6, which I'll get into in just a second. Yellowstone earthquake activity remains at background levels. And for the month of April 2019, below background levels. I mean, it was pretty damn low. But it, it seems to just be starting to increase again and going back to normal. There were no major changes in surface deformation in the Yellowstone area as recorded by GPS stations. And we'll take a look at the GPS raw data so that we can see, are they telling the truth? Are they not? See, that's why I love these possibilities. You can confirm what the professionals are saying. So, that's the monthly Yellowstone Vol uh, Volcano Observatory update. Again, Steamboat Geyser did erupt only two times in the month of April. It broke its near-perfect once-per-week schedule and is now erupting on random dates, except the most recent eruption, which occurred on May 3rd, 2019. That one actually occurred a week after the last one, so could be returning back to its schedule. Could be. Here we are at the Steamboat Geyser 2019 page on my website under the Seismic Events drop-down menu. Scroll down, scroll down. This is the most recent eruption right here, which occurred on May 3rd. Again, there were only two eruptions in April, which was this one, the 13th eruption, which is the second largest eruption of 2019. And the third largest eruption of 2019 was the 12th eruption. So they seem to be increasing in amplitude and length of seismic trace. So I thought that was very interesting. Again, this is the 12th eruption, which occurred on April 9th, which would be April 8th in Mountain Time. You can see the change right there and go up. 13th eruption of 2019 occurred at 425 UTC on April 26th, 1025 PM Mountain Time, April 25th. This eruption is the second largest eruption and then did not occur in the month of April, but most recent one is this one right here, which was the largest steamboat eruption of 2019. And it does seem the past few eruptions are getting bigger and bigger. The most recent eruption below, as you can see, is the 14th eruption and is currently the largest one in 2019. Amplitudes are increasing as well as the length of the eruptions. This most recent eruption was so strong that it actually was detected on a second seismic station, YNR. Usually steamboat eruptions do not show on YNR unless they are very powerful. Is it possible steamboat will continue this into the foreseeable future? We'll have to wait and see. It has been almost exactly a week since the previous eruption, so Steamboat might be returning to its near-weekly schedule. Stay tuned for more and stay safe at the park. Remember, Yellowstone contains many dynamic hazards, and it's still an active volcano. Someday, I hope to visit Yellowstone. Also, April has been a month of near silence for Yellowstone. Of course, some quakes have popped off here and there, but it has been more quiet this month than any other month that I remember. However, just in the past week, there were two minor to moderate energetic swarms that broke out within about a day of each other. Let's check it out. Here we are at the Yellowstone Caldera, Wyoming page. Under the Seismic Events drop-down menu, click Yellowstone Supervolcano to come to this blog right here. The most recent blog post, April 29th and April 30th, 2019 swarms. The only two earthquake swarms of April 2019. The first one occurred on April 29th and occurred right here on the first Lewis Lake with a couple stragglers up near West Thumb Lake, right up there. Scrolling down, this is what the swarm looked like. Here's spectrogram plots of most, I'm pretty sure almost the entire swarm. You can tell it was indeed another rapid fire swarm. And you can see it on the heli plots right there. Scoot forward, you can see it right there. And then the next, and then I show some plots. And I also show the seismic audio. April 30th, 2019, Mary Lake. Mary Lake is, is just, east of here but it's more near lower geyser, geyser basin excuse me 
and Norris Geyser Basin's right up here, Purple Mountain, Madison River. It was very small. Although it only shows two earthquakes here, they did report six for the earthquake swarm, but you could tell there were more than six. No more than 30 microquakes at the maximum, though. You can see the spectrogram plot of most of the swarm here. In my opinion, it was a rapid-fire swarm until it started to die down. Magnitude seemed to increase just a little bit at the end, but started to seem to uh, increase in pairs. You notice that? Here's a pair. Here's a pair. Actually, there's three right there. There's a pair. There's a pair. There's a pair. Very interesting. So we did have a little bit of swarming in April, but right at the end, April 29th and April 30th. For the Yellowstone Supervolcanic Complex, the largest earthquake to occur within the month of April 2019 was a magnitude 2.6 all the way down here and 3 kilometers in depth on the eastern shores of Lewis Lake, just to the south-southwest of West Thumb Lake. It struck as part of the April 29th Rapid Fire Swarm and occurred at 518 UTC on April 29th, 2019. For your convenience here, the seismogram, spectrogram, and spectra plots of the largest earthquake to occur at Yellowstone during the month of April 2019. This was the magnitude 2.6 at 3 kilometers in depth on the eastern shores of Lewis Lake, which was the strongest event during the April 29th, 2019 Rapid Fire Swarm at Lewis Lake. Now, it is the largest event of that swarm and also the largest event of the month of April. So, let's move on to deformation at Yellowstone. Okay, you will notice this is something different and that we're not on volcanoes.usgs.gov anymore. I will leave a link to this new website below. Well, it isn't new, but I just recently discovered it. This map was made by the Geodetic Laboratory of the University of Nevada, Reno, UNR. This GPS uh, plot map they're actually the same ones that Mary Greeley uses in her videos. Well, at least she did a while back. I don't watch her videos much anymore since I don't really have time to watch YouTube videos. But this is an awesome website. It will show you all-time GPS deformation plots for every single GPS station on the face of our beautiful planet. No joke. Look at how many stations there are, guys. Plus, there's some that aren't even shown on the map all the way down in Antarctica. Yeah, there's even some in Antarctica, guys. You can see all the plots just by clicking any of these blue charts here. Notice that? I'm clicking some, clicking some. Notice that? They look very familiar, don't they? Very interesting. This source is amazing. Again, all you do is click one of the blue squares and it will open up the three component plot. The reason I use this now is because most of the GPS plots on volcanoes.usgs.gov did not take into account the motion of the North American plate. Any station on the North American plate has an extra reference frame called NA-12. Actually called NAM-08 for Central Washington University, but I don't use CWU anymore since UNR, University of Nevada, Reno, is more accurate in my opinion. Because of not selecting NA-12 most of the time, my projections of horizontal deformation were wrong. Not too wrong, but I'd rather be as accurate as I can be. Now, let's zoom into Yellowstone real quick, shall we? Now, let's start with LKWY, which resides right here on the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake. Click it once. Now, I'm going to go here, click the plot. This is how you do it, guys. Station ID LKWY. Yep, that's the correct one on the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake. IGS08. Notice how east, north, it is showing it is moving, let's see, southwest, right? Well, let's remove the motion of the North American plate. Boom! It looks much different, doesn't it? And now the horizontal deformation sort of does coincide with the vertical deformation. That's why I think NA12 is very important. First off, remember east shows east-west horizontal deformation, the way the ground shifts towards the east or towards the west. North means north-south horizontal deformation, and vertical shows uplift or subsidence. Sadly, LKWY is no longer sampling data, and I think the seismic and GPS co-located stations are offline and have been for a while. But you can see here the past two decades saw two episodes of substantial caldera uplift. Here's the first episode, here's the second episode, here we are right here. Let's go all the way over, we have not been at this level since late 2006. That is why it is my belief Look at the pattern, guys. And it has happened before, I believe, in the 80s this happened too. But look at the pattern. I believe the pattern will grow once again in the next year, I'm going to say at the max. Year or two. Right when the first uplift episode began, note the ground shifted towards the south at the same time. 2004, 2006, 2004, 2006. Started shifting to the south just a little bit during the uplift sequence. Now, LKWY is located 
pretty much right on the southern edge of the Sour Creek Resurgent Dome. And remember, measurements right here on the left are in millimeters. Sometimes they're in meters, sometimes they're in millimeters. So always keep your eye on this. Note that the east-west chart didn't show too much of a change. I mean, very small, very small, if at all. But it seems to be mainly north-south deformation and vertical upward to subsidence that is changing. Let's move on to another GPS instrument which resides on the Mallard Lake Resurgent Dome near the Upper Geyser Basin, right near where Old Faithful resides. Now here's the GPS deformation chart for OFW2 which resides on the Mallard Lake Resurgent Dome, right near the Upper Geyser Basin near where Old Faithful resides. Note the same cannot be said for this station which resides on top of the Mallard Lake Resurgent Dome again. Uh, you know, there is a slight change in the horizontal components, but not like what we saw at LKWY. However, we do see the past two periods of uplift here as well. Notice this station started a little bit later than LKWY did. I believe LKWY started in 1997, 1998, something like that. This started around late, late, late 2003. Now, something that I don't like about these plots is the inability to shift the time range to a range that you want. Don't fret, guys. I found a way. Let's take a look at recent deformation from January 1st, 2018. So, almost a year and a half worth of GPS data. Now, here's a custom scatter plot showing vertical deformation, uplift or subsidence, for OFW2, which resides on top of the Mallard Lake Resurgent Dome near the Upper Geyser Basin. Notice I have Microsoft Excel. OFW2 UNR NA12. Measurements on the left are in meters. This GPS data was gathered from UNR NA12 reference frame via the UNAVCO web service. The beginning of this scatter plot is January 1st, 2018, and the last dot at the end is April 29th, 2019. One sample is taken once per day. Note that it looks like subsidence sort of stalled throughout 2018. Notice that? I know YVO said that it was occurring at a few millimeters per month, but if look at the trend I, I mean from here to here there might be a little bit of subsidence but I it, it just looks like it's stalled to me but notice right around here once mid November 2018 hit subsidence has continued and you can obviously see that right here subsidence is still occurring at the caldera but again I do believe caldera wide uplift is just around the corner that's just an opinion so who knows each horizontal section from line to line is 20 millimeters. It seems YVO is correct that subsidence is occurring at a rate of about a few millimeters per month. Sometimes a little bit greater, sometimes a little bit smaller, but we'll continue to keep a close eye on Yellowstone. And here we have the deformation charts for WLWY, which resides just a few miles northeast of Yellowstone Lake, WLWY and A12. Remember the top two are horizontal and the bottom plot shows uplift or subsidence. Note that we see the same sort of pattern, the deformation pattern here, that we did on LKWY. Seeing that this station resides just northeast of the northern tip of the Yellowstone Lake at Yellowstone Caldera, on the eastern edge of the Sour Creek Resurgent Dome, that's where this station is located. Now let's take a closer look at recent uplift subsidence patterns. Uplift subsidence patterns for WLWY on the eastern edge of the Sour Creek Resurgent Dome, just northeast of the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake. The beginning of this scatter plot is January 1st, 2018, and the last sample taken, the last dot all the way at the end, is April 29, 2019. Again, data is taken from UNR via the UNAVCO web service and A12 reference frame, so the motion, excuse me, the motion of the North American plate is removed. Note that we see the same trend of ongoing subsidence as we are seeing on all stations across Yellowstone Caldera. Each horizontal section from line to line is 20 millimeters. Subsidence is being recorded on this station at a rate of approximately a few millimeters per month, just like what YVO stated, and we have the data to back it up. However, I must say, at WWY, there was a little bit of a bump right here. I do have to say there's a little bit of uplift, very minor, and then stopped, and then continued. But overall, you can tell subsidence is occurring, which, again, I state that I believe is going to change very soon. And here is NRWY in the Norris Geyser Basin near where Steamboat Geyser resides. Norris sees a different uplift subsidence pattern than any other station in Yellowstone called Dara. Some are theorized to be caused by an intrusion of magma in the early 2000s, and other theories put hydrothermal fluids and brine as a possible culprit. Overall, any fluid-caused uplift or earthquakes usually has deep origins in the magma system itself. 
Sometimes fluids or gases can escape from magma and attempt to make it to the surface. However, in the case of 2014, notice 2014, 2014, and 2014, I personally believe that uplift was caused by a small intrusion of magma at Norris. Again, note the spikes. Coincidentally, this is also the same exact time that Yellowstone saw its largest earthquake since 1998, or possibly even before that, but from 1998 through 2018, the largest earthquake was the magnitude 4.8, which occurred right at the peak of uplift at Norris during 2014. This is my quake statistics page. All five pages in the quake statistics drop down menu just got a serious overhaul, guys. I completely redid all of the pages and they now contain much more accurate information now and show a whole slew of plots and charts. The quake statistics menu is located under the more drop down menu on my website. So, going back, after the quick spike in uplift, subsidence continued until about 2016. It has been rising ever since. However, just recently, as in the past six months or so, uplift has stalled. So let's take a closer look at the most recent GPS data for NRWY at Norris, just to see where uplift subsidence patterns are headed. And here we have NRWY UNR NA12 opened in Microsoft Excel to create a scatter plot. This is GPS data from UNR for vertical uplift subsidence, reference frame NA12 for station NRWY and Norris. The beginning of the plot is January 1st, 2018, and the last sample taken, the last dot all the way to the right, is April 29th, 2019. Note that it does seem like uplift sort of stalled right around here in 2018, and then took a quick dip right down here, and let's see, right around the 200 mark, so right around late July, early August of 2018, uplift started once again. And you can tell, I mean, the GPS data is obvious showing, and I use Delta U, guys, meaning that this is showing uplift substance patterns from January 1st, 2018 through April 29, 2019. However, the past few months, it does seem like it has stalled out. But I do not believe subsidence is occurring here. I think it is just stalled temporarily i don't know whether it's going to last longer or not but the ongoing trend since what i believe 2016 or something like that the ongoing trend is uplift so we should see this continue but we'll see where this is headed in the next monthly update now let's move on to the next volcano or should i say super volcano called long valley caldera which resides just east of yosemite right on the slopes of the sierra nevada range now here we are at the Long Valley Supervolcanic Complex. Let me turn on the terrain just real quick. The caldera rim is right about here, just letting you know. Most of the earthquakes occurred on the southern section. Some spread out even farther to the south, and I'll talk about this in just a second. Now, according to USGS, Long Valley in Eastern California is the center of continuing volcanic activity and moderate earthquakes. Links to instrumental monitoring of geophysical activity in the area, if you click there. Now they're talking about non-eruptive volcanic activity, but volcanic nonetheless, and very concerning back in the late 90s. Now, it is also interesting to note, the area has since experienced numerous swarms of earthquakes, especially in the southern part of the caldera and the adjacent Sierra Nevada. The most intense of these swarms and began in May 1980. Interesting. That's the same month and year Mount St. Helens erupted. In interestingly enough, that's also the same month and year that volcanic activity spiked worldwide. I mean, it was pretty bad. So, May 1980, and included four strong magnitude 6 shocks. Three magnitude 6s on the same day. Following these shocks, scientists from USGS began a re-examination of the Long Valley area, and soon they detected other evidence of unrest, a dome-like uplift within the caldera. They're referencing the resurgent dome right there. Measurements showed that the center of the caldera had risen almost a foot, 30 centimeters, since the summer of 1979. That's crazy. Wow. After decades of stability. This swelling, which by 2014 totaled more than 2.5 feet, 75 centimeters, and affected more than a hundred square miles is caused by new magma rising beneath the caldera. And according to USGS, there is approximately 240 cubic miles of magma at a shallow depth right under the caldera. 
Long Valley currently houses enough magma to support a massive super eruption if it erupted today. Although there is no sign of that right now, the unrest in the 80s and the 90s, which included large uplift, seismicity, and tree kill events, taught us that this volcano could be nearing a super eruption, even much more so than Yellowstone. Calderas can see increased volcanic unrest, possibly for decades, before actually erupting. However, if an intrusion event were to occur that would lead to a super eruption, it could only take weeks or months for the super eruption to occur. So that, uh, yeah, definitely got to watch it very closely. In my opinion, Long Valley Caldera is the most restless volcano in the continental United States, not counting Mount St. Helens. You know, people are always worried about a super eruption at Yellowstone, and maybe rightfully so in some cases. However, people never pay attention to Long Valley, which is much closer to a super eruption than Yellowstone is. So, there were 336 earthquake events reported for the Long Valley Caldera area for the month of April 2019. Now, I must say, a lot of the seismicity for this month occurred as part of an ongoing swarm down here near Bishop, California, actually more near Round Valley, California. Many magnitude 2s and some 3s have been striking this confined area near Bishop, even one that was first reported to be a 4.0 but downgraded to a 3.9. I took a look at the data, and in my opinion, it does not look volcanic in nature, but you never know. You can use the NCDC Data Select URL Builder to download the data for the stations near the epicenter. First, you probably have to use the Iris G map. Enter NC into the network parameter and press Update Map. Then download the data and the program Swarm and take a look. Moving back to Long Valley, seismicity remained within the southern margin of the caldera right here, with a little bit right up here near the northeastern section of the caldera, just a few quakes, majority in the southern margin and spread out to the south, and of course, about half, I'm going to say, maybe even a little bit less than half of the seismicity in this area did occur down here near Round Valley, a very strange location for an earthquake swarm. I must admit to you guys that I did make a mistake in all of my previous updates. I thought that these earthquakes were occurring on the deformation front, seeing that the GPS data showed the ground was moving towards the southwest. As you will see in a second, I was wrong. I forgot to take into account the motion of the North American plate. When the motion of the North American plate is removed, you can actually see that the ground at Long Valley is shifting towards the northwest, not the southwest, as I thought. It is strange, however, that very few earthquakes, if any at all, occur under the northwest section of Long Valley, which is where it's going. Most of them occur on the opposite side, within the southern margin of the caldera, spreading farther to the south beyond the base. But none on the deformation front right up here? I don't know, that kind of confuses me just a little bit. See, that's why I stick to seismology, not geodesy. I do kind of dabble in geodesy just a little bit because for monitoring volcanoes it's required, basically. But I'm more of a seismologist guy than a geodesy guy. We can see here that many of the largest events for this month occurred down near uh, Bishop, California, actually more near Round Valley, California. The largest event for the ongoing swarm down there for the month of April 2019 was a magnitude 3.9 at 9.3 kilometers in depth on April 15th at 1755 UTC. Actually, 122 people reported to USGS that they felt this earthquake. Just real quick, here's the three-plot image showing the magnitude 3.9 at 9.3 kilometers in depth in Round Valley, California, south-southeast of Long Valley Caldera. They really need to update this instrument really, really bad. This is one of their old analog stations, I believe. NCDC, if you're listening to this, please replace MTU with an actual broadband station. Actually, I think they should take out all of their old analog stations and replace them with broadband stations. They'd be Monitoring would be so much better that way. Now, the largest earthquake to strike Long Valley Caldera itself during the month of April was a magnitude 2.2 at 4.0 kilometers in depth right inside the southern rim of the caldera. It struck on April 19, 2019 at 719 UTC. For your convenience here, the seismogram, spectrogram, spectra plots of the magnitude 2.2 at 4.0 kilometers in depth, which was the largest earthquake to strike Long Valley Caldera itself during the month of April 2019. Looks like a normal, high range frequencies, volcano tectonic earthquake. Yep, little spike after 15 hertz right there. That's a little interesting spike. Don't know why that is, but let's move on. Here we are back at the UNR geodidic map showing GPS deformation plots and where the instruments are located for all areas, all instruments, all throughout the world. Now I'm going to use, notice we have Long Valley Caldera right here. 
I'm going to use station. Nope, that's not it. And nope, that's not it. Where is it, guys? There it is. R-D-O-M, which resides right on top of the Resurgent Dome at Long Valley Caldera. Let's click on it. Now, there is something I want to apologize to you guys about. Remember how I said the ground was moving towards the southwest in all my previous volcano updates? As it is showing right here, right? Well, look at the reference frame, IGS-08. That is the reference frame that they use for volcanos.usgs.gov for this station I was looking at. And a lot of the stations at Long Valley, I thought, were showing that it was moving to the southwest. But the actual deformation... The actual horizontal deformation needs to be seen in the NA12 reference frame. So let's go back and let's see what is actually occurring, not part of the North American plate motion. But here we have our DOM, the same station, but NA12 reference frame. It still says it's heading to the west, as you can see right here. But with the North American plate motion removed, it is now heading towards the north, showing that Without the North American plate moving, Long Valley Caldera is shifting towards the northwest, not the southwest. I'm sorry guys, I did make a mistake, that was my bad. And that just goes to show that understanding the plots you read is huge when trying to understand what is occurring. Also, you can see ongoing uplift of the resurgent dome since this station was installed in 1999, about 1999. We see subsidence was occurring actually, but at about 2002 we did see a spike in uplift right here. And then goes back down and then is pretty steady for a few years. A tiny, tiny, tiny uplift, but it's pretty steady. But right around late 2011, right around here, we see a large spike in uplift that has been ongoing since. You can tell the uplift is not seasonal at all. So that means that it's likely renewed uplift is being caused by new magma filling the reservoir, or the magma is trying to rise slowly to the surface to start an eruption. Now, why don't we take a look at uplift subsidence patterns for this same station, but instead from January 1st, 2018 through April 29, 2019. As you can see here, we have RDOM from the Resurgent Dome in Long Valley Caldera, UNR N812, opened in Microsoft Excel and added to a scatter plot. This shows vertical, uplift, or subsidence. Data was obtained from UNR via the UNAVCO web service reference frame NA12. The start of this scatter plot is January 1st, 2018, and the last sample all the way at the end is April 29, 2019. And by the way, each horizontal section is a total of 20 millimeters from line to line. We see uplift was ongoing almost constantly until right about late fall 2018 and then we see it kind of steady and then we see subsidence has been occurring but as of the last data that is showing it's still confusing it, 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 subsidence was occurring for a little bit and usually it is very short-lived it does not last long usually but it looks like uplift could be starting again as is the usual trend since late 2011. Now here's the GPS station which resides on the northeastern slopes of Mammoth Mountain between the base and the summit. Mammoth Mountain is located on the southwestern rim of Long Valley Caldera. Again, you can find the locations to all these stations and more if you look at the links below and go to the UNR map. Contrary to popular belief, it is actually thought that Mammoth Mountain's magma chamber is completely separate from Long Valley's. However, Long Valley's magma system contains much more magma and is in close proximity to Mammoth Mountain's magma system. I wouldn't be surprised if one day Long Valley's magma system takes over the one under Mammoth, if indeed it does have a separate system. For the north and east horizontal components, you can tell something weird occurred right after this station was installed. Notice that? Just know this is definitely a glitch. If this big of a difference truly occurred in the ground, we would have definitely seen like a magnitude 9 at Long Valley called there. It definitely would have kickstarted a massive earthquake. Cause that's, that's a lot of millimeters, guys. What's that? Two, about two meters. About two meters of a drop. Look at that. Two to three meters of a drop. Yeah, that would be like a magnitude 9 earthquake if it was that big. <laughs> However, in the end, you can sort of tell which way this station is showing us the ground is heading. It is heading towards the west, north, northwest just like the other stations in the area now note the vertical component here at the bottom showing uplift or subsidence it is actually showing continued subsidence almost constantly since this station began recording deformation in 1999 the uplift in the area is occurring at long valley most intense the closer you get to the resurgent dome 
As you can see, we have GPS data from LINC UNRNA12 opened in Microsoft Excel. And I added the Delta U data to a scatter plot, which will show us vertical uplift subsidence since January 1st, 2018 through April 29th, 2019. Each horizontal line, or excuse me, each horizontal section from line to line is a total of 20 millimeters. Remember, when viewing these custom GPS plots taken from the raw data from UNAVCO, the measurements on the left are always in meters. Overall, I do believe subsidence is continuing to be recorded by this station just barely. Long Valley sees a lot of uplift, but from what I can see, Mammoth Mountain does not. You could see there was some slight inflation, well, uh, I'm going to say right in 2017-2018 winter. Then during the summer, it dipped down. And then the 2018-2019 winter, probably I'm going to say mid-fall to late winter, it went up. And now that it's spring, pretty much is mid-spring right over here, we see it going back down again. When seeing these yearly fluctuations that coincide with seasons, they also occur in non-volcanic areas. These are seasonal changes, but the fact that they appear in non-volcanic areas and the fact that they coincide, and it's just these fluctuations, these small fluctuations, they should never be big, they should never be massive, they should never have a growing trend to it, but many, many places with GPS instruments do detect slight seasonal fluctuations. Here is GPS station P647, which resides on the northeastern rim of Long Valley Caldera. Although in a diminished form, you can see uplift has been recorded here as well, all the way to the northeastern edge of the caldera rim. Even though caldera uplift seems to have been greater the closer you get to the resurgent dome, as it should, the entire caldera was swelling as well. These stations confirm the ground is shifting towards the northwest. Notice, heading west, heading north, any 12 reference frame, the motion of the North American plate was removed. Now remember, you can find the locations of all of these GPS stations and more, and they even come with their own plots, by visiting the link section below and looking for the UNR map. Since this station doesn't really show too much because it's farther away from the actual uplift epicenter where it's actually occurring, I'm just going to skip the custom in-depth plot and go straight, for the sake of time, because we don't have a whole lot of time left, I'm going to go straight to Newberry Caldera in Oregon. And here we have the Newberry Caldera Volcano, which resides in central Oregon, just south of the city of Bend and east of the city of Lapine. It is a shield volcano with enormous volume and still considered to be active. Gotta turn on terrain just for you. Notice there are six earthquakes. But according to the University of Oregon, there are hot springs around both Paulina Lake and East Lake. At times, the hot springs are too hot to bathe in and must be mixed with the cold lake water to be comfortable. Second, drilling at the center of the caldera found temperatures of 540 degrees Fahrenheit at about 3,000 feet below the caldera floor, the highest temperature recorded at a Cascade volcano. Also, Newberry Caldera is part of my updated page on earthquake statistics. Here's the Newberry Earthquake Statistics page on my website, which I have completely redone from head to toe. I also have yearly quake statistics of data from 1998 through 2018, including many GPS plots and seismic plots as well. Not just for Newberry, but Mount Rainier, Yellowstone Caldera, Long Valley Caldera, and even the Cascadia Subduction Zone. Simply go to my website. Again, link is under my email address in the description box below. Go to the More drop-down menu, go to the Quake Statistics menu, and there it is. Only six earthquakes were reported during the month of April 2019 for Newberry Caldera. All six of them occurred right under the caldera itself. One here, one here, one here, which was the largest of the month. One here, here, and here. Keep in mind, a good portion of seismicity lately at Newberry has been low-frequency earthquakes and or possibly low-frequency tremor, but low-frequency earthquakes. But now be careful. Sometimes quarry or mine blasts can appear as low-frequency earthquakes. However, they usually never blast at night. I believe it's against the law in some areas. They usually don't do multiple ones over and over and over throughout any given day. And the characteristics of a mine or quarry blast can sometimes be easy to distinguish from low-frequency earthquakes if you have a good eye. But even the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network has labeled many earthquakes in the Newberry area as low-frequency earthquakes on their earthquake catalog. Of course, however, high-frequency earthquakes still occur. 
I believe the presence of low-frequency earthquakes at Newberry, seeing they are small and usually occur by themselves or in pairs, is caused by small degassing from the magma reservoir or local hydrothermal activity. The largest earthquake reported for Newberry during April 2019 was a magnitude 1.1 low-frequency earthquake at 1.1 kilometers in depth, which struck the southeastern rim of the caldera on April 1st, 2018 at 1014 UTC. As you are about to see, this is no doubt a low-frequency earthquake. Note that the low-frequency earthquake, which occurred about 30 seconds prior to the one you're about to see, was not reported. Here is Seismic Station CPCO for the data stream of April 1st, 2019. CPCO resides right in the center of the caldera. It is a broadband station in the CC network. No location code is given. Persistent rescale is off. Overlap is set to 95. Maximum frequency of the spectrogram is set to 25. I am going to enable, as you're about to see, high pass enabled, 0 0.8 hertz high pass filter to the eighth power. Press OK. All right, so we're going to look at the reported 1.1 low frequency earthquake. Notice it says it occurred at about 1014 UTC on the first. So here we are at the first. We're going to look at it at 1014 UTC in just a second. And if you'll notice, it is this event right here. There are two events. The first event was not reported, but the event about 30 seconds later was the one that was reported. But first off, let me turn on spectrogram. I just want to go through the day with you. I'm going to be very quick with this because I don't have much time, but I'm just going to go through the day. It does look like there were three tiny quakes there. Don't know for sure if those were quakes or not. Little, these are definitely quakes. Those definitely look like little, tiny, tiny, little, little, itty bitty earthquakes. Very tiny, very tiny. Keep going forward. Nothing much to see. Nothing much to see. Come on. One little quake there. Come on. Let's see. One little quake there. Barely even noticeable. And we get into something right here. Doesn't look like too much of the actually to me looks like a rock fall, some type of surface event. Here's an earthquake right here that was not reported. And you can obviously tell it is a local earthquake likely occurring right under the caldera itself. Notice the high range frequencies. Dominant frequencies going up to about 10 hertz, but we do have weaker frequencies going up to about 17.5 hertz. But that's not what I wanted to look at. Let's keep going forward. Keep going forward. Keep going forward. Keep going forward. Kind of want to skip all of these. Remember, it's at 1014 UTC. So nothing much. There are a few quakes during this day that were not reported, but they're very, very tiny. And then, look at this. We do see one low-frequency event. This was not a quarry or mine blast, you can tell. That could possibly be passed off as a teleseism. But to me, that looks more like a local low-frequency earthquake. Go back to the spectrogram. Notice. Looky, looky here. What is this? What do we have here? Now, to the untrained eye, someone who just looks at spe uh, uh, spectrograms, they would probably say, oh, yeah, that's a teleseism. No, frequencies are too high. This is not teleseism, especially since this one was reportedly the 1.1 magnitude earthquake, which is a low-frequency earthquake. Let's go to the waveforms, shall we? Let's look at the first event that was not reported. Look at that, guys. Ain't that impressive, huh? Let's go to the spectrogram. That is obviously a low-frequency earthquake. Now, if you were to see this constantly, I mean, maybe not constantly, but if you were to see this over and over and over again with no apparent increase or decrease for it to be an earthquake, so obviously the P wave is right where the energy increases, this would be a tremor if it was constant. That would be concerning, and that would be a low-frequency harmonic tremor, but it's not because it's a low-frequency earthquake. This one, again, was not reported. Going to about 1,000 amplitude count, probably going to say 0.8, Low frequency earthquake, maybe around the same depth. Let's log power log frequency off. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely tell it's a low frequency earthquake. Yep. Now, let's log power. Go back to the spectrogram. I want to look at the reported magnitude 1.1 that you can see right here. Again, this was reportedly an earthquake. Look at those waveforms, guys. Look at those near perfect waveform spacings, too. Look at that. Going up to about 2000 amplitude count. So the last one, again, was probably like a 0 0.8, maybe 0 0.7. Again, there's the spectrogram. Let's look at the spectra plot. Log power log frequency off. Oh, yeah, definitely a low-frequency earthquake. Not even much energy at all. Even weaker energy barely even surpassed 5 hertz. Yep, definitely low-frequency earthquake. Within, I'm going to say, the dominant frequencies rest between 1.8 hertz and about 3.2 hertz right there. I'm not going to go through any more. There were a few other events throughout the day, such as these events right here. 
but I am unsure of what these are. These could be some type of tremor event, but these do have higher frequencies, much higher frequencies than the low frequency earthquake that we saw earlier. So let's move on. Notice we have Newberry Caldera just east of Lapine, south of Bend, Oregon, right here, right in the smack dab center of the Caldera CPCO. Let's click on that. So here is GPS station CPCO, which is co-located with seismic station CPCO, right smack dab in the center of Newberry Caldera. We can see that east-west horizontal chart barely shows any changes at all since 2011-2012 when monitoring began in Newberry Caldera. The north-south horizontal component shows the ground is slowly and slightly moving towards the north since 2011-2012. Remember, the motion of the North American plate is removed if you use this reference frame, NA12. The vertical plot all the way at the bottom showing uplift or subsidence is showing overall slight subsidence of the caldera. If you have already been watching this video, then you know what these yearly fluctuations are that you see right here. These are seasonal changes which are recorded in volcanic areas and non-volcanic areas alike. Meaning, it is a sort of background noise, kind of like background noise recorded by seismometers, but on a much longer and much bigger scale. However, these fluctuations should never be large. As you can see here, they are not large fluctuations, but they do occur. Now let's take a closer look at GPS data for this station since January 1st, 2018. Here we are in Microsoft Excel. As you can see, we have CPCO and A12 UNR. Delta U, which will show trended data, which is exactly what we need from January 1st, 2018, all the way down to the bottom to April 18th, 2019. Now, usually samples are taken once per day, but here the samples are a little off. Sometimes they skip almost two weeks of sampling data. So there are some gaps in the data, but we will get a good idea of how the uplift subsidence patterns have been progressing since January 1st, 2018. Now, this chart is not properly labeled since I just made it just now, as you can see. This data, again, was taken from UNR via the UNAVCO web service and A12 reference frame. This shows vertical uplift or subsidence deformation from January 1st, 2018 through April 18th, 2019. Each horizontal section from line to line is a total of 10 millimeters. We can see an obvious inflationary trend right here. Right when late summer, early fall of 2018 hit, which was right about this area right here, subsidence started to occur. This is opposite of what I've seen in other locations. So I cannot say whether this is actual uplift coming from volcanic processes or if it is part of the seasonal fluctuations of the ground. So this could be seasonal, this change, a slight inflationary trend and then going down. That could be seasonal, could be not, I don't know. You be the judge. Overall, Newberry remains at background levels for deformation and seismicity, actually a little bit below background levels, except for the low frequency earthquakes, which are extremely interesting as to why they're even occurring at all. Now, Let's talk about Mount Rainier. Now here we are at one of the most infamous Pacific Northwest volcanoes, Mount Rainier, which adds a beautiful but potentially deadly backdrop to the Seattle skyline. There have been only seven reported earthquakes for Mount Rainier at all, even the area around it, during the month of April 2019. As you can see here, three struck right under the summit, three within the West Rainier seismic zone, and one straggler far to the southeast down here. This is yet another month of extremely low seismic activity for Mount Rainier. Also, if you go to Mount Rainier within the quake statistics menu on my website, like I showed earlier, you will notice Mount Rainier has not experienced a good amount of seismicity since around 2006, maybe even longer. Go check that out if you want to find out now. Why has Rainier been so quiet lately? I know it has been somewhat quiet for a long time, but the past six months or so have been way too silent. I don't know, guys. But any active stratovolcano that has a massive magma system like this volcano does would make me wonder why the volcano has dipped below background levels. I don't know. You be the judge. I'm here to just give my opinions and present the data. The largest earthquake to occur in the Mount Rainier area during the month of April 2019 was a magnitude right under the summit, magnitude 1.4, at 1.5 kilometers in depth, again, which struck right under the summit on April 11, 2018, at 1720 UTC. For your convenience, here are the seismogram spectrogram spectra plots for the largest earthquake to occur in Mount Rainier stratovolcano within the month of April 2019. 
we see normal high range frequencies peaking at about 4.4 Hz and somewhat dropping by 8.5 Hz. This is a normal high frequency VT, volcano tectonic earthquake, which can be caused by either volcanic, hydrothermal, or tectonic processes. Even rock fractures or failures within the stratovolcano itself can cause these high frequency events underneath volcanoes. These VT events are part of the normal background seismicity for volcanoes worldwide. Now here's GPS station MUIR, which resides on the eastern slopes of Mount Rainier, somewhat between the base and the summit. This is the only real working GPS station that is actually on Mount Rainier itself, so I thought this was the best to use. We see the two horizontal components at the top show around late October 2012 that there is a jump of approximately 60 millimeters to the northeast. Remember, this is NA12 reference frame, so the North American plate motion is removed. According to the University of Nevada Reno Geodetic Laboratory, that during this time, there was a magnitude 7.8 earthquake all the way up on the western shores of Canada, somewhere near Alaska. They were right that the timing coincides perfectly, but I am questioning whether 60 millimeters is even correct. Obviously, this is how it was recorded by the station. Maybe there was a rock fall or something on the slopes of Rainier at the same time? Because a jump of 60 millimeters to the northeast caused by a magnitude 7.8 almost a thousand kilometers away doesn't make any sense at all. 60 millimeters is a lot for a station to move in one day, so let me know what you think. The vertical component here at the bottom shows ongoing subsidence of the area on Mount Rainier, along with those seasonal fluctuations that I mentioned earlier in the video that appear at both volcanic and non-volcanic areas. Here we are in Microsoft Excel, we're going to take a closer look of MUIR, which resides on the eastern slopes of Mount Rainier, from January 1st, 2018, so Delta U for uplift subsidence, all the way down here to April 23rd, 2019. Select the entire area, press insert, scatter plot. Remember, this was gathered from UNR with the NA12 reference frame. North American plate motion is removed. Let me turn on a trend line for you. This is a scatter plot generated from MUIR showing vertical uplifter subsidence deformation from January 1st, 2018 through April 23rd, 2019. Again, measurements on the left are always in meters when taking this from uh, the UNAVCA web service. And please just know that there are gaps in the data that are not shown on this plot, but we will still get a good idea of how deformation is occurring for this area on Mount Rainier's eastern slope. Each horizontal section from line to line is a total of 20 millimeters. Right around late summer, fall of 2018, we see an increase of uplift right here that was slow and steady for a while and has been subsiding since late winter of 2018, maybe even early spring of 2019 and still is taking a dip as of right now. This is part of the ongoing seasonal fluctuations that I mentioned earlier in this video. Now, let's move on to Mount St. Helens. Now here we are at the volcano that gave my mother a very bad day on May 18th, 1980, Mount St. Helens. This volcano pummeled my mother's house with inches of ash and even rained ash on my dad's car in Denver, Colorado. The main Mount St. Helens eruption ejected 0.29 cubic miles of ash compared to the possible 240 cubic miles Long Valley Caldera might at the maximum eject during its next super eruption. Now, as you notice, I am zoomed in. You're probably wondering why. Oh, why didn't you do the outskirts of this area? You'll notice 12 out of 12, meaning that all the 12 earthquakes are in this box right here. But the box is uh, a lot bigger than this. Trust me, I do Mount St. Helens and the area surrounding it. And for the month of April 2019, again, there were only 12 earthquakes reported, which is far less than last month's total. This is because the majority of the seismicity last month occurred as part of a small swarm. This month, however, April 2019, Mount St. Helens has returned to the state of diminishing seismic activity. Many of the Cascade volcanoes are going extremely quiet, just like Mount St. Helens, so why is that? As history has taught us, this quiet will not last long. But how long is long? Nobody can know for sure. Most of the seismicity occurred to the north and to the northeast, with only a few occurring under the stratovolcano itself. The largest earthquakes to occur at Mount St. Helens for April were actually four magnitude 0.6 events that you see right here. I will deal with these two right here. One at 8.1 kilometers in depth and the other at 9.4 kilometers in depth. 
one occurring on April 19th and the other on April 20th. Since they are both of the same magnitude, all four are actually, I will use the most recent one which is highlighted right here. It struck on April 20th at 7.11 UTC, 0 0.6, and 9.4 kilometers in depth all the way up here. For your convenience, here are the seismogram spectrogram spectra plots of the largest and most recent earthquake to strike the Mount St. Helens area within the month of April 2019. It is very hard to see on these plots simply because the earthquake was very small, but you can tell this was it. Note the normal high range frequencies making this a VT, Volcano Tectonic Earthquake. It struck just to the northeast of Mount St. Helens. VT quakes can appear as part of normal background seismicity for volcanoes worldwide. It was a magnitude 0.6 and 9.4 kilometers in depth on April 20th, 2019. Sadly, there are no GPS deformation instruments inside the crater of Mount St. Helens. There are two faulty instruments that were placed on the lava dome at one time but barely recorded any data. So I tried to find the closest station possible to the crater, which would be this station here, P699, which resides on the south, southwestern rim of Mount St. Helens. Since this station was activated in 2005, it has been recording that the ground has been moving toward the northeast. Notice going east and slightly going north. Note the bottom plot all the way down here, which shows uplift or subsidence has been showing overall slight subsidence of this area on Mount St. Helens since about 2005, with those obvious spikes in seasonal fluctuations, which I talked about earlier in this video, and I do believe these ones, since they're so severe, so quick, and so short-lived, and also coincide with seasons, specifically winter time, I believe this is either snowpack or an increase of ice buildup on the antenna. I'm not a professional, it could be something else than that, but you can tell they do always coincide with seasonal activity, but overall, subsidence has been occurring since 2005. Sadly, if uplift were occurring again within the crater itself, we might not be able to see it. However, I doubt overall subsidence would be so prevalent if indeed uplift were occurring within the crater. Since we cannot get an absolutely amazing look at how deformation is progressing within St. Helens, let's just move on to Mount Hood. So here we are at the Mount Hood Volcano in Northern Oregon, which straddles the border between Washington and Oregon. Now before I start, I just want to state that a new fault line has been discovered cutting through Mount Hood. A link will be posted in the description box below under resources, however, it'll probably be near the end of the resources list. They think this newly discovered fault could trigger a magnitude 7.2 earthquake at best. This is pretty crazy for any stratovolcano. If that were to happen, it could really damage it, not only geologically, but volcanically as well. Because who knows what that type of earthquake could do to the magma chamber below. Now for the month of April 2019, there was only one reported earthquake, which is smaller than the total of two for last month, as you can see here. Mount Hood is generally extremely quiet seismically. Although Cascade Volcanoes may be temporarily going quiet, Mount Hood really cannot be added to that list since it's already extremely quiet to begin with. The largest and only earthquake reported for Mount Hood during the month of April 2019 was a magnitude 1.8 at 6.1 kilometers in depth right under the south southeast base right here. It struck on April 4th, 2019 at 1746 UTC. For your convenience, here are the seismogram, spectrogram, spectra plots for the largest earthquake to occur under the Mount Hood stratovolcano within the month of April 2019. You see this magnitude 1.8 at 6.1 kilometers in depth was a normal VT volcano tectonic earthquake, which is part of normal background seismicity at volcanoes worldwide. One thing to note, however, is the strange absence of strength right here between 7.5 hertz and 13.2 hertz. Just thought it should be mentioned, thought it was very strange. You can also see the gap right here on the spectra plot as well. Sadly, MHTL, this GPS station right here, is located on the south base of Mount Hood, far from the summit and actually not even on its slopes at all, but I thought I would use it anyways. Note that we see the ground is slowly shifting towards the northeast with the motion of the North American plate having been removed from this plot. You can see going towards the east and going towards the north since about, I'm going to say, late 2006, I'm going to say. We also see on the vertical plot here at the bottom that overall subsidence is occurring with seasonal fluctuations that I mentioned earlier in this video. However, notice the past year or two of subsidence seems to have stalled. Do you notice that right there? Overall subsidence was pretty much occurring but seems to have stalled the past year or two. We will have to wait and see where this is headed. Now, let's move on to Mount Shasta. 
Here is Mount Shasta, which resides just south of the California-Oregon border. If you have ever driven from nor uh, excuse me, southern Oregon into northern California using Interstate 5, you already know that the volcano is quite large. In my opinion, Mount Shasta is California's version of Oregon's Mount Hood, especially in regards to seismicity. This volcano is typically extremely silent, guys. I rarely ever see more than a few quakes reported here for each month. During the month of April 2019, we see only one earthquake has been reported. It struck just beyond the base of Shasta, just to the east, right here. It was a magnitude 0.7 at 4.1 kilometers in depth on April 21st, 2018 at 11.46 UTC. For your convenience, here are the seismograms, spectrograms, spectra plots of the largest and only earthquake to strike Mount Shasta during the month of April 2019. Note the normal high range frequencies making this a VT, volcano tectonic earthquake, which can be caused by volcanic, hydrothermal, or tectonic processes and is part of normal background seismicity at volcanoes worldwide. Mount Shasta remains below, way below background levels. I mean, it's like, it never sees any earthquakes ever, but you always keep an eye on it. You never know. Here are the GPS plots to station P657. This station resides on the western base of Mount Shasta. It was the closest one that I could find to the summit of Shasta, or even its slopes. An A12 reference frame means the motion of the North American plate has been removed. Note that we see this station is telling us that the ground is shifting towards the northwest. Notice it is showing us ever since about 2008, going down towards the west, going up towards the north. So, the ground is slowly and steadily shifting towards the northwest, not due to North American plate motion since an A12 reference frame has been added. All the while, the station is showing us that this location around Mount Shasta is very, very slowly, just barely subsiding at all. Although it is hard to see on the vertical chart here at the bottom. Note, again, that overall subsidence is occurring. Remember, reading chart labels is paramount, especially the labels on the left, which are in millimeters, but sometimes could be in meters, so you always gotta look. Also notice that we see the same seasonal fluctuations that we see from many GPS stations all across the country, including volcanic and non-volcanic areas. Although Shasta has not erupted in a long time, I would be very, very shocked if any eruptive or even non-eruptive volcanic activity would occur at Shasta. However, it is a volcano and it's not extinct to the best of our knowledge, so it will continue to be monitored throughout the foreseeable future. Next, let's move on to the last volcano of the update, Lassen Volcanic Center. And here we are at the last volcano in the update, Lassen Peak in Northern California. Again, Glacier Peak in Washington State will be added to the update once new instruments have been installed. This is a volcano which resides in Northern California, just 60 miles southeast of Mount Shasta. It last erupted in 1915 and is still considered to be highly active. For the month of April 2019, there were only eight earthquakes reported for Lassen Peak, which is much lower than last month's total of 17, and far lower than the month before that, which saw 40. Lassen Peak is the southernmost volcano in the Cascade Range, and it seems Cascade volcanoes really are going eerily silent. Why do you think that is? Let me know below. All of the earthquakes occurred directly under Lassen Volcanic Center itself. Notice there's an earthquake here. And most of the earthquakes are here, so I'm going to turn on satellite just so you can see. Again, all of the earthquakes occurred right under Lassen Volcanic Center, right under the ridge of summits, with the exception of one straggler off to the east right over here. The largest reported event of this area during April 2019 was magnitude 0.8 at supposedly negative 0.9 kilometers in depth on April 2nd, which is the earthquake that struck far to the east right near the border of my coordinate box that I set up for this location. For the plots I'm about to show, you know that I don't like using outlying stragglers, so let's use the second largest event, which actually occurred right under Lassen Peak. It was a magnitude 0.5 at 4.3 kilometers in depth on April 29th, 2019 at 2110 UTC right here. For your convenience, here are the seismogram, spectrogram, spectra plots of the largest event to occur under Lassen Peak Volcanic Center itself for the month of April 2019. This magnitude 0.5 at 4.3 kilometers in depth was a normal high frequency VT volcano tectonic earthquake, which occurs as part of normal background seismicity for volcanoes worldwide. Here is GPS station P666. Personally, I would have picked a different name for this station. Joking aside, this station, with the motion of the North American plate removed, is showing that the ground has been steadily shifting towards the northwest, 
all the while subsi excuse me, subsiding at a constant rate as well. These spikes on the vertical chart are odd and do show on surrounding GPS stations. However, they all coincide with the seasonal fluctuations and tend to not act like any real inflationary or deflationary event I have ever seen. Sadly, most of the GPS stations in this area are offline right now as of the past, I'm going to say maybe four to six months, so we cannot get the most recent data. But we can see subsidence is slowly occurring since about 2008. And I would be somewhat surprised if Lassen Peak erupted in the next 100 years. That is because Lassen Peak is the only other volcano in the continental United States to explosively erupt since the year 1900. It erupted in 1915 through 1917, smaller than Mount St. Helens but still extremely massive, and was the first volcanic eruption to be extensively photographed. Don't believe me? Simply go to the Google image search and enter Lassen Peak 1915. All right, here we are back in the seismic program swarm. Right now is 515 UTC, May 5th, 2019, which is also 1015 PM Pacific time, May 4th, 2019, because UTC is ahead by, I think, seven hours or so. The first four stations you see in HV are from Kilauea and the area around Kilauea and Pu'uo'o. And the last four down here are from Yellowstone around Yellowstone and West Thumb Lake. So it seems, of course, that Yellowstone and Long Valley supervolcanoes have the highest seismicity counts out of all of the volcanoes I showed for the month of April 2019. No surprise there. Cascade volcanoes seem to be keeping their pattern of diminishing seismicity. Of course, concerning activity at any of these volcanoes will warrant its own video and its own blog post on my website, especially if increased deformation is spotted in conjunction with increased seismicity, almost a sure sign that a magma chamber is growing restless for an approaching eruption or major intrusion event. For those who watch my videos, please go check out my website. My website is helpful in conjunction with my YouTube videos and it already contains a great many pages with hundreds upon hundreds of seismic plots and images for many different events and many different volcanoes. And I'm actually redoing a lot of the pages so it's gonna even get better. I'll also be able to upload more info on there than if I was just making YouTube videos. So if you like, please go check it out. The link to it is below my email address in the description box below. The next monthly update will be for May 2019, which will be uploaded about, I'm going to say, four to five days after the month has ended. I usually try to get out my updates around the fifth of every month, but sometimes it doesn't really work out. Excuse me. I hope to someday become more educated in regards to volcanoes and earthquakes, and I do hope to become a volcanic seismologist, but I'm already equipped to give you guys a heads up if concerning activity may ever rear its ugly head. Any support would be amazing, and no, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about personal support from my viewers. Thank you all, and keep your heads up, and please be prepared with, at the very least, two weeks of food and water per person within your household. Please double that per child that you have under the age of 12, just in case. I know that sounds like a lot, but after all, when disaster strikes, you can never be too prepared. It's better to have it and not need it, than to need it and not have it. Amen. If any mistakes have occurred or I'm wrong about anything, please feel free to let me know below, even in the public comment section. As you can see, I did make some mistakes in my previous updates, and when I know it's a mistake, I will always publicize it so those who have been misled can get back on track. I'm a chill guy that actually is okay with constructive criticism. Sadly, the world, and especially YouTube, has too big of an ego right now to think constructive criticism is a good thing, especially many specific YouTubers. This is why I rarely watch YouTube videos anymore, except for a few select videos when I have time. I simply rely on the data for my research while making YouTube videos and blog posts so people can enjoy and learn from the research that I spend so much time on, and I do spend a lot of time on it. I will always stand for the truth no matter where it leads. Why? Because the truth is considered hate or fear to those who hate or fear the truth. God bless. Please stay safe and let me know what you think. Ben Freyolo is out of here.